And uh, first, let me thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's not a function without all of you. I would like to also thank all of our sponsors, the vendors, the hospital, Shasta Regional. This event would not be possible without the help of Shasta Regional. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fabulous Gaia Hotel and the 8th Annual Cardiovascular Conference. We'll be beginning shortly. Please come in and find your seat. Please silence all electronic devices. Find a seat closest to the front as we expect to be filled to capacity. Once again, we'll be beginning shortly. Okay, so obviously he's doing his job. He was told a few minutes before to make sure that you make the announcement. Somebody needs to tell him that we are starting. <laughs> but uh, please do silence all communication devices. And uh, we do have evaluations. Please make sure you complete those evaluations. It helps us determine what you liked, which speakers you want back. So that is very important to us. You will be getting your CMEs at the end of the day. Um, our first speaker, our keynote speaker, comes to us from the Mecca of Medicine, the Mayo Clinic. And uh, I'm very, very grateful, Steve, that you accepted our invitation to come to the North State. It's not easy, it's quite challenging to get to Reading coming all the way from Minnesota. And uh, by the time we finished dinner, it was you know, close to one in the morning, Eastern time, and had to get him back up again. Uh, he is professor of medicine and cardiology at the Mayo Clinic and president of the American Society of Prevention. He's obviously extensively researched, an author, educator, and I am very, very pleased that he made it all the way to come here to Reading to speak to us this morning. Steve? Thank you very much, Mohammed, for your gracious invitation to come here. I've never been to this part of California. It truly is beautiful. I was up going, uh, doing a little activity this morning and walking around the neighborhood, and they had wild plum trees and wild peach trees. I can't tell you how many peach trees I've planted that are supposed to grow in Zone 4. They just don't grow <laughs> in Zone 4 in Rochester, Minnesota. The, I do have one request, though, and that is, would you ask that man not to talk while I'm talking, please? <laughs> <laughs> We can, what we'll talk about for the next few minutes is what I call the four pillars of cardiovascular disease prevention. That we hear a lot of things, we read a lot of things, you know, patients come into us now with loads of things they've heard about on the internet, taking supplements, they don't, they don't even know what's in them. And we try to get them back to the basics and say what really works, what really helps you, and that's what we'll go over here for the next few minutes. I do want to talk about my disclosures. The, um, as uh, Mohammed said, I was the past president of the American Society for Preventive Cardiology. Uh, which I think is uh, what, where we all need to go. Prevention is our future, and uh, our, our country actually depends on, our economy is going to depend on preventing because we're not going to be able to treat this disease anymore. If you look at the rates for cardiovascular mortality over the past few decades, you can see they've really come down. And of course, we know why they've come down. It's because of cardiologists, right? I mean, we've done that. <laughs> Well, you know, if we look at uh, things like statins, you know, we think, well, statins done a lot. Well, they really came along long after the, the, the curve started to go down. Angioplasty, cardiologists, unfortunately, we can't take all the credit, I'm afraid. What about things like bypass or aspirin and beta blockers? They actually came much later. It really seemed to start right about the time of the Surgeon General's report on smoking. And that really started lifestyle change. And that's when the, it really started to go down. So we've done a good job in our country, I think, of lowering the cardiovascular death rate over the past few decades. If you look, though, at non-communicable diseases around the world, it's very interesting. Non-communicable diseases about a dozen years ago took over as the number one cause of death. In about 2000, for the first time in the history of the world, people died from eating too much rather than eating too little. That's the way it's been for thousands of years. We didn't have enough antibiotics, enough, enough food, and people died for that. Cardiovascular disease, the number one cause of death, and the interesting thing is that 80% of deaths are going to be in low middle income countries in the next few decades. If you look at, at this in the darker colors or the higher death rates, you can see Russia, uh, China, Indonesia, uh, India, 
there are going to be huge death rates there as compared to what they've had over the past 100 or 200 or thousands of years. And what's I think most interesting is who's going to die of heart disease? You know, what age group dies of heart disease? Well, what age group in this country dies of heart disease? You can see here on the left that in Portugal and the United States, both advanced countries, you can see that the working population, which is the lower three colors, um, is it's very low incidence of death in those groups. In fact, the working population mortality is about 10% in Portugal, 12% in the United States. But look at countries coming over the next three decades in Brazil, India, and Africa. Brazil, 28% of their deaths uh, of their pop, of their deaths are going to be in a working population. India, 35%. South Africa, over 40%. So we need to be cognizant of this because a lot of the patients that we're getting now are people who have come into this country for the first time and they're exposed to our risk factors that they've never been exposed to before. It may be the, uh, the, uh, uh, the survival gene that they, uh, people that have lived in countries that didn't have much food for millennia, now they're exposed to a lot of high calorie food. They actually have a higher instance of death. If you take an Indian male from the, con from the country of India, and give him the same risk factors as a Caucasian male, his risk of dying of heart disease is much higher. So there's something different, genetically different about that group. So does this happen in the United States? My God, of course not. This doesn't happen in the United States. We can look at, at the life expectancy birth, and you can see right there around Rochester, Minnesota, of course, because of Mayo Clinic, we all live to be, you know, <laughs> above average and all that good stuff. <clears throat> but look at uh, here in Mississippi, Louisiana, parts of Alabama. The average lifespan is about 13 years shorter. Is it genetic? Is it uh, lifestyle? Is it the foods? Is it the salt in the water? It's probably somewhat of all of the above. But clearly there's a real discrepancy in this country too. Now, if you want to prevent cardiovascular deaths, how do you do it? Well, our, our standard has been wait till you're 65, get a bypass or an angioplasty, start rehab, and we'll do secondary prevention. Does secondary prevention work? Well, let's see. If you want to prevent more deaths, this is from a UK database of about 5 million people you can see that the yellow is primary prevention and the white is secondary prevention. So across the age spectrum now of men, from your 20s up until your 80s, you can see about 80% of the deaths you're going to prevent to 90% are going to be primary prevention. So if we wait until they have the disease, it's too late. Women are very similar, not quite as much, especially early on in their life in their 20s and 30s. So the key to reduction of cardiovascular mortality is going to be primary prevention. And they don't come to us. We don't see them. <laughs> you know, we just don't, the patients don't come to you and say, okay, I'm 28 years old. I want, I want to prevent a heart attack from occurring 40 years from now. That just doesn't happen much. So there's four keys to a healthy lifestyle in the United States. One is non-smoking. 76% of American adults do not smoke. Uh, a body mass index of less than 25. Now, only about 40% of us have a body mass index less than 25. Of course, some people are like me, very muscular, so my body, <coughs> but, um, but uh, it's about 60% of us are overweight. Um, five fruits or vegetables a day, only one in four of us do that, which is really sad, especially just walking around the neighborhood today, seeing all the peaches and the plums that are growing. And then being active, uh, physically active, exercise at least 150 minutes a week, one in five of us. Now, if you take all four of those things, these are things, you know, that you've learned growing up in school and such, and your parents told you. But only 3% of us do all four of these, which is really sad when you think about it. It doesn't matter who you are, what your income is, what your age, your sex, where you live in the country. If 97% of us are not doing it, it really doesn't help. And if you look at, if you did all four of these, at least for a couple of decades, in a retrospective study from the uh, BH, uh, BRFHS, which is the uh, behavioral uh, phone calls they make around the country of 150,000 patients every couple of years, you can see that you'll reduce your event rate by almost 90%. Now we're going to talk in a few minutes about what happens when you do this prospectively, because these are obviously, this is a retrospective data, and it may be, uh, may be uh, different patients they've looked at than ones that we can actually get to change their lifestyle. But if you look at other countries, like in the UK, they've looked at similar things. What about mortality and lifestyle here in men and women in their 40s to their 70s? You can see they found four good behaviors, non-smoking, physically active, the fruits and vegetables, the same again as we had. And now they added in, instead, uh, they looked at alcohol, one drink a day for a woman, two drinks for a man. And they followed them for 11 years and said that if you would had uh, your mortality risk versus all four of these behaviors, meaning if you had three of them, your mortality risk was about 39% higher. 
If you had two, only two, it was about double. Only one, four and a half, uh, two and a half times. And if it was, you only had none of them, you had a 400% greater chance of having cardiovascular or, or total mortality. So it's very clear that mortality risk for those with four versus zero of these health behaviors was equivalent also to being 14 years younger. Now I tell that to people and women usually say, well, does it mean I look 14 years younger? <laughs> I say, yeah, if you, you don't smoke, you'll have less wrinkles, that's for sure. Uh, the Scandinavian countries have looked at this also. <clears throat> this was 24,000 women, <clears throat> looked at them for six years. Again, looked at the diet, looked at alcohol, non-smoking, physically active, and this time they added waist-hip ratio and followed them for six years and said, if you had any two of these versus none of them, then your death uh, rate was 55% lower. Going up, to if you had all five of them, again, about there's that magic 90% number. We can reduce it by 90%. Now, none of us are going to check out of this world alive. All of us at some point in our life, if you think about it, are going to be the next person on this planet to die. None of us are going to leave alive. But this is going to help you at least pick your, your, your time of exit and pick maybe your modus of exit, and I'll talk to you more about that in a, in a moment. But you can see even the Scandinavian countries, only 5% of the population has all of these lifestyles. So how do you want to, how do you want to check out? You know, how do you want to leave this world? Do you want to live in the last, uh, last 20 years of your life in a nursing home, demented? I don't think so. But you can, there's basically four ways, and this has been looked at. You can have sudden death, boom. You know, we, that, that may not be a bad way, as long as you knew it was when it was going to happen. <laughs> um, yeah, that's right. Terminal illness, you know, you get a cancer or something, uh, bad heart disease, and you die very quickly. Organ failure, very unfortunate, and frailty. Obviously, this is a long, broad, uh, uh, drawn out one. The non-smoking, the regular activity, the eating fruits and vegetables and ideal weights is the best way to avoid the bottom two, these chronic diseases that you're going to be in a nursing home and have an un unpleasant life for a prolonged period of time before you die. Now, Will Mayo, or Charles Mayo, uh, Will says most of the quotes. I try to use a few from Charles. He was the younger brother. The, uh, it's unfortunate that so few appreciate from what small causes diseases come. And I think that's very true. These, these four things I'm talking about are not that big of a deal. They're just little things every day. But let's look at them a little more uh, in depth. Non-smoking. Well, who benefits the most from a smoking ban? You know, it's interesting. They've done smoking bans, like in Pueblo, Colorado. We did them in Rochester, Minnesota. And, who, and heart attacks go down within a month of, of stopping smoking. And there's, you can look at three groups. You can look at current smokers, you can look at former smokers, and you look at never smokers. Well, you know, current smoker, who's going to benefit the most? Of course, a current smoker. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? Current smokers' heart attack rates goes down by about 15 percent, 14, 15 percent. Former smokers go down 19 percent. How about never smokers? They go down the most, 21 percent. In fact, two-thirds of the decrease in hospitalizations for heart attacks is among non-smokers. Why is that? There's something special about smoke. It's unfortunate. If you look at levels of smoke, you know, there's first-hand smoke. That's if you smoke. Second-hand smoke, you're in a room with somebody that smokes. And, you know, those are okay because you, uh, you can control those. Third-hand smoke. Has anybody ever talked to their patients about third-hand smoke? No? Yes? Good. Especially grandmothers. <laughs> Especially talk to grandmothers about it. It's when someone smokes outside, you smell smoke on your hair, your clothes, your carpet. They say, oh, Grandma, you smell like smoke. I tell grandmothers, don't smoke in front of the kids. Oh, they say, oh, God, doctor, it'll be 40, 40 degrees below zero. I will go outside and smoke. I would never smoke with my grandchildren. I will not do that, doctor. I am so wonderful, I just don't smoke around my grandkids. I say, do the grandkids say, gee, Grandma, you smell like smoke? She says, yeah. Well, I said, then, you know, that's, there's a tobacco residue called NNA. It damages your DNA can potentially cause cancer. They found that kids that smell the smoke, if you smell it, you inhale it. You inhale it, you absorb it through your lungs. They found those uh, carcinogens in the kid's blood. They found endothelial dysfunction occurring uh, with, with uh, people that get third-hand smoke. And babies, of course, are the most vulnerable. They crawl on the rugs. They fall asleep on the couch. They teeth on the furniture or on your hands after you've held the, the cigarettes. And I'm happy to say that Neil Benowitz, who's the chief of clinical pharmacology at UCSF and the chair of the California Consortium on Third-Hand Smoke, wait until the lawyers hear about third-hand smoke. You think this problem with, with, with uh, what was the stuff a few years ago, mold in your house? You know, they couldn't sell your house because of mold. Wait until you have third-hand smoke in your house and the lawyers get, it, get a hold of that. 
and how they can cause, they can come back and sue you a few years later because their person that bought the house got cancer and you sold them a, a house. It's gonna be crazy. I mean, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna go crazy. What about obesity? Is it a US problem only? No, <laughs> I don't think so. I think that we're all uh, kind of getting into this. And you've all seen this map. You've seen the prevalence of self-reported obesity. This is again from BRFSS data. And this is now from 2013. And what's interesting is that no state now is below 20% in obesity. Uh, and we all like to pick on the South. I mean, look at there, 30% of them are obese. But where I live, it's almost, it's also 30% up in the Midwest. The Northeast, 26%, even out here in the West, 25%. So we're all doing it, we're all getting it. And even the, you know, the last bastion, which was Colorado, I mean, you can walk 10 feet in Colorado and you're at a high, you can walk up a great hill and get good exercise. A few years ago, they went over 20%. Uh, so it's unfortunate, but we're all getting more and more obese. And the good news is, that actually overweight is going down in this country. Have you heard that statistic? People are they're less overweight now than they were 10 years ago because the overweights now are becoming obese. <laughs> yeah. So if you look at, uh, you know, how to calculate uh, BMI, and it's interesting, we have one way to define underweight, one way to define ideal, and three ways, and probably four ways to define overweight. Has anybody ever been to Alaska and talked to Eskimos about snow? They have about 20 words for snow because their whole life is snow. We have, we're going to have probably 20 definitions of obesity because our whole life is going to be obesity. In fact, the one group is the super obese. And super obese, you can define it as 100 pounds overweight. Some say 150 pounds overweight. Some people say it's a BMI of 50. They can argue back and forth. But one thing is very clear, the super obese are going up. Why is that? I asked Mike Jensen, who is the chair of the, uh, the the primary author on the obesity guidelines that came out a year and a half ago at Mayo, he said it's true, they are. It's because the super obese used to have to do something. Now they can go to the supermarket and they park in a special spot right next to the store. They get a little car in the store that drives them around the store. Then they go back to their car, they get home, they get on the online, they call a pizza place to deliver pizza to them. They don't have to do anything anymore. There is no activity. If you look at a person that is, has a BMI over 40, in a 24-hour day and say how inactive is a person with a BMI over 40 in a 24-hour day, what do you think? It is 23 hours and 54 minutes. They're inactive in a 24-hour day. And you ask them, you say, are you active? Oh, God, doctor, I'm doing stuff all the time. I'm, I'm always going to the refrigerator and, you know, I, you know I, <clears throat> I'm really busy. But the super obese is unfortunately growing. And they're difficult to take care of, very difficult. Uh, obesity, if you look at this million uh, patient database or, or population database from New England Journal a few years ago, you can see that in women or in men, the, the ideal uh, weight or BMI would be in the 23, 24, 25 range, you know. And that's something that we're just not achieving anymore. And it's a U-shaped curve. If you get too low of a weight or too high of a weight, it clearly goes up. But once you get a BMI here of about 30, you know, you double your risk for dying. And if you look at on top of obesity or BMI, look at the waist circumference, which is probably the better way to measure it. It's just so hard. You know, Framingham never did waist circumference, so we never really got much data from them early on. And it's hard to measure people's waist. That uh, if you look at, if you have a, uh, uh, here in men, a waist of 37, uh, compared to a waist of 45 inches, you're, even with the same BMI, your risk for a death doubles. Women going from 30 to 39 inches, your risk for death doubles. So that's on top of BMI. So clearly the, uh, the increased waste is the bad one. Now this is, how do some countries handle this? Well, this is a poster from uh, uh, a uh, clinic in Japan where uh, it says goodbye metabo, and metabo is a word, word meaning overweight. You can see the adults are overweight and the kids are overweight and even the little dogs are overweight. So they passed a law in Japan. Has anybody heard about this law? In, uh, in, their, in their diet, that's the name of their Congress, they uh, passed this law in 2008. They said you're gonna have mandatory measurement of waistlines at your workplace. So you had to work, and if you worked, they'd measure you. And I asked a, a Japanese surgeon that I know, and he says, yeah, they come to my hospital, they measure my waist, they write it down, you know, they walk away. And uh, they, they will find the company and your local government if your waist is over a certain amount. They don't find you, they find your employer and your local government. And this is not a typo, the men's waist is 33 and a half and the women's is 35.4. 
Japanese are the only culture that I know of where the women actually have a bigger paunch than the men in adulthood. And since that went in in 2008, they reduced obesity by 10% in 2012. By the end of this year, they're on, on track to reduce obesity by 25%. Now, what's happened to obesity in this country in the last six or eight years? You know, it's skyrocketed. It hasn't gone down. Now, I've talked to politicians, many politicians in our state, uh, nationally. Would you sponsor a bill like this? After they stopped laughing, <laughs> they said, are you kidding? This is political suicide. I am not going to, I'll vote for this bill, but I'm not going to sponsor it. They would, I would lose the next election. And plus, our, our society just wouldn't go for it. The Japanese probably will, but ours won't. But we need to do something on a national level that's going to help us. Now, what is our approach? Well, you know, our approach, you're going to get a great talk, I'm sure, from um, uh, about uh, uh, weight loss and obesity here later today. But our approach for many things is, is medicines. You're going to get a great talk on lipidology. But if you look at the caloric intake in adult statin users and non-users, it's very interesting here over the past 15 years. You can see that non-users of statins are here. Their intake's actually gone down for calories a little bit. What happens to statin users? Our weight is actually, our caloric intake has gone up over the past 15 years if you take statins. And the BMI increased more in statin users than non-users. Why is that? Well, it's human nature. You go to the doctor, you go to the nurse practitioner. Oh, good, good job, Joe. You got your LDL down to 100. And Joe says, ah, oh, that's great. Well, next time uh, I'm at the county fair, I'm going to have an extra corn dog or something like that, you know, extra hamburger. So it's just human nature, I'm afraid. What about fruits and vegetables? This is really the, this is probably the epicenter of fruits and vegetables, uh, I think, in our country. And if you look at fruits and vegetables, they decrease coronary heart disease for every portion that you eat a day. And a portion is a serving, a serving is a tennis ball. So that's an easy way to remember it. Each serving of fruit per day over 10 years lowers your risk of heart attack by 7%. And you can see fruits and vegetables, um, the more you eat, the less risk of heart attack. Obviously, it never goes to zero. And the mechanism is really unknown. We know the DASH diet, even with an isonatremic diet, eating DASH with the same salt load, DASH means mainly more fruits and vegetables. You lower your blood pressure, so you can lower it 5 to 10 points. We know there's a lot of micronutrients in the skin of fruits and vegetables, and that helps. Which ones that need to be uh, taken are not really clear, but of course, again, the American answer to this is, well, if the fruits and vegetables are good, let's take them, desiccate them, put them in a pill, and sell them to you. <laughs> or put them in a bottle, and we mix them up and put it on a shelf for six months, then we sell that to you. Anybody ever eaten a piece of fruit that's on the shelf for six months? Does it have many nutrients in it? No, it doesn't. So it really should be fresh. I mean, we've never seen data from non-fresh uh, fruits and vegetables prolong your life, although I should say frozen, flash, flash frozen, has been shown to be good, too, without, uh, without salt in, or sugar in them. So we need to start thinking in calories. <clears throat> and you know, they don't ever advertise calories, do they? they you, know, you never hear the hamburger place say, eat our big burger, triple burger, for 2,000 calories. <laughs> You don't hear the people at the stop and goes or the, you know, the uh, places you go with your car to get gas say, oh, get a big slurp that has 3,000 calories in it. You know, there is one group that's actually uh, looked at it, though. And, uh, but they found that people eat the same volume of food over days. So the secret is to eat a volume of food that has less calories in it. And that's one reason fruits and vegetables may be so good. And uh, so if you eat um, four ounces of fat, that's about 260 calories. Uh, four ounces of protein, that's half that, about 120. Carbs the same way, and then lots of fiber with the fruits and vegetables. You get a quarter of what you get with fat. So that makes it a little easier to understand how it can help with uh, hopefully controlling weight, too. Now, one group that has advertised calories is guess who? The beer industry. Right. It's been a big deal to them. In the Super Bowl, they had an ad for a 50 calorie beer. You know, they've gone down below even the MGD 64 calorie beer. So I tell patients, you know, if you, if you are active one day, you go out and build up a sweat, you work real hard, and you're huffing and puffing, then you get a beer. But make sure it's a light beer or something like that. Don't make, you know, make sure it's not a Sam Adams uh, double bock that would, you know, have more calories than you possibly could have expended, you know, in six hours of exercise. Now, the other thing about fruits and vegetables that's shown to be uh, very helpful is we've had actually diet studies. And the best diet studies, I think, have been the Mediterranean diet. And the most recent was the Predimed study, which came out in the New England Journal about a year, and, or almost two years ago now. The, um, they looked at the uh, Mediterranean diet, 7,000 patients, mostly women, kind of looked like an American population, BMI of 30, 40 percent on statins and 50 percent on ACEs. And they gave a Mediterranean diet, which is a very specifically prescribed diet 
There were 10 do's and four don'ts. The do's are things you probably know about, you know, fruits and vegetables, fish, uh, multigrains, nuts, etc. And the don'ts were the red meats, um, the, um, was also, they tried to get on people about eating pr processed foods, because they have a lot of trans fats in them. And if, I'll put my email up at the end of my talk, and if you want to send me an email specifically asking for the brochure I give patients every day, probably 10 times a day, on the Mediterranean diet, it has a quiz in it, a 14-question quiz. You take the quiz. If you're doing that one, great, but be honest. And if you're not doing it, then work on it. And it's, a, it's progress. I tell patients it's progress. It's not perfection. You cannot say tomorrow I'm going to eat Mediterranean. One thing when you talk to patients about Mediterranean, You'll say, I want you to eat a Mediterranean diet. They say, oh, good, Doc, I know what Mediterranean is. Yeah, that means I eat, I eat some broccoli and I put some olive oil on it, you know, that's <laughs> with, my, with my cheeseburger. And you say, no, I, I need to be very specific. This is a specific diet that's been shown to work. And so they actually looked at it with Mediterranean plus extra virgin olive oil, extra per day, plus our nuts versus a low-fat diet. And guess what the low-fat diet was? The good old American heart low-fat diet. This is the fifth study in a row that the Mediterranean diet has actually beaten the American Heart low-fat diet to reduce cardiovascular mortality. Isn't that sad? Because why? Because the low-fat diet pushes everybody to carbs, and we know what happens. They eat a ton of carbs. They say, oh, doc, I never eat fats. I just eat uh, all the, you know, the chips and dips and stuff. So the primary endpoint of the PREDIMED study was acute MI, stroke, or CV death. And of interest, the extra virgin olive oil group got four tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil a day, and that's a couple hundred calories. You know, that's, this is not a weight loss diet. This is a feel better, live longer, have less strokes and heart attacks diet. Uh, the nut group, they got three walnuts, six almonds, and, I, uh, and, and eight hazelnuts, and it was part, uh, it was in Spain, but I think the, uh, the, the California nut growers actually contributed some to this. And people were saying after the diet, well, this was biased, and they were, the nut growers, you know, supported the diet. I said, give me a break. I mean, they, and it was interesting that nuts could not be eaten after dinner. Why? Because nuts satiate you. They fill you. So don't eat them after a meal. Eat them before a meal. And it's only a handful. You know, 10, 12 almonds a day basically is all you need. And uh, not, uh, I tell my, my male patients, not 10 to 12 handfuls <laughs> a day. <clears throat> And so this was the uh, data points, and you can see that the, uh, the control diet, American Heart Low Fat Diet, versus the Mediterranean and the, with extra virgin olive oil or nuts, that the Mediterranean lowered uh, the, the uh, event rate by about 30%. And the, D, the Data and Safety Monitoring Board actually stopped the study at about less than five years early. They said we cannot ethically go on and continue to, to do this study because we found that the people t eating Mediterranean are actually doing better. And if you look at the study very closely, it's very interesting that when the, it was in, done in Spain, so if you can imagine in Spain, everybody reverts to what? A Mediterranean diet. So they actually uh, said they would tell people to eat low-fat diet, and then uh, they would meet, them, meet with them once a year. The other group, they said eat Mediterranean, they met with them th four times a year. And about halfway through the study, they really didn't see much difference. Uh, it was barely different in the, in the outcomes. And they looked at all their patients, and they found that all the American Heart low-fat diets were reverting to Mediterranean. So they started saying, we're going to meet with a, with a low-fat uh, group three t every three months. Once they did that, the last half of the study, the difference in uh, outcomes was 50 percent. But it's only reflected as 30 percent here. And all the benefit was due to stroke reduction, but of course they stopped it early. But there was reduction in, uh, in heart attacks and uh, and. Um, and cardiovascular death, it just wasn't significant. But the question that's very interesting to me is, why does it work? And one way to answer that is, when does it work? So if you look at here, at when it started to divert, and we blow this up, uh, you can see that uh, this part right here, which is shown, uh, the Mediterranean diet benefit actually started to occur in the first three months. And so the postulation is that there's a, it's a good anti-inflammatory diet, which is olive oil and the nuts are anti-inflammatory. So uh, it, what else would, could it do? Because it, it really didn't affect LDL. It didn't change that. It didn't change weight. Uh, they were the same activity. They didn't um, do anything activity difference. So it likely was this anti-inflammatory. And other studies have shown uh, anti-inflammatory is very good for a lot of the rheumatologic diseases. And also that since that diet study came out, they've had sub-studies that showed that the Mediterranean diet, as defined in the PREDIMED study, uh, lowered metabolic syndrome, lowered diabetes, lowered Parkinson's, lowered Alzheimer's, and plus stroke, heart attack, and death. So these are all sub-studies. So it really does help you uh, quite a bit. 
Now, the last part is the activity. You know, how active do we need to be? And uh, it, activity is very different than eating. You know, studies have shown that Americans make uh, decisions every day. We make decisions about eating. We make decisions about activity. How many decisions do we make a day about eating? About 200. How many decisions do we make about activity? One. I'm going to do it or I'm not. <laughs> you know, and the eating decision is not I'm going to do it or I'm not. It's I'm going to eat this or that, you know, and uh, pick something healthy or, or unhealthy. So I try to sh sh shy away from using the word exercise. Why is that? Well, people don't like exercise. They, they don't like the word. I use vigorous leisure activity. And people say, wait a minute, what's vigorous leisure activity? Tell me about that. I like that. So I actually ask, one day I ask all my patients, you want me to tell you about exercise or vigorous leisure activity? Guess what? It was unanimous. Everybody wanted to. You know, if you had a kid and you said, okay, 10-year-old uh, kid, do you want this grape lollipop? Or do you want this, this um, uh, stick with a carbohydrate loaded with monosodium glutamate and purple dye number six? <laughs> you know, what are they going to pick? They want the le vigorous leisure activity. So I've actually gotten involved with the leisure, world leisure activity group. I didn't know this existed out there. I mean, you get, you get in, our, in our groups of cardiology and we get, you know, so blinders on. But there are universities in this country uh, that turn out thousands of leisure activity measures per year. What do they do? They run health clubs. They're personal trainers. They help you, you know, organize your life activity-wise. And they use the word leisure activity. They stay away from the word exercise. And that's worldwide. So why, why is that? Well, you know, the uh, Harris Poll actually about eight years ago said they did a word association, a, a poll, people off the street. Love, what do you think about exercise? Do you love it? Do you enjoy it? Are you neutral? Do you dislike it or you hate it? Well, 40% of Americans said they hate it. 25% said they strongly dislike it. And I'm in that group. I don't like to get on a machine just to sweat. You know, we all love to play tennis with our spouse or walk in the woods with our kids or, you know, play a neighborhood softball game. But none of us really like to get on. I mean, some do. Sure, there's some crazy people out there. That, <laughs> but that's just not us. <clears throat> now, the data is clear. If you, you know, your exercise capacity and all-cause mortality is a very clear relationship. You know, if you're, if you're a normal, if you can go over eight Mets versus less than five Mets, and remember on a Bruce protocol, one Met is one minute, uh, and four Mets is about two flights of stairs quickly. So if you can get over eight Mets, you have a much greater chance of living a longer time than if you can go less than five Mets. If you have known cardiovascular disease, it's the same, the same relationship. It's not quite as uh, distinct a difference, but it's clearly there. Uh, so just being active and being in good shape, uh, and you can say, well, that, that may just be we're picking people again. We're just pulling people out there in good shape. Well, if you look at, uh, at observational studies now of daily physical activity and all-cause mortality reduction, it's very interesting. And they've looked at now in hundreds of thousands of patients, vigorous activity here in the blue, moderate activity in the green, and then the total would be here, this red line. And this is a 400,000 patient study followed for 3.4 million patient years. I mean, that's a pretty big study. The, uh, they found that 60 is where it starts to level off, 60 minutes a day of uh, total activity is where it starts to level off. Uh, but you get benefit with just 15 minutes a day of doing something. So I tell patients, you know, if you want to live longer, feel better, go out and start being active. And 15 minutes a day for six days a week will really help you uh, do all those, uh, do both of those things. It will reduce cardiovascular mortality 20 percent, reduces cancer deaths 10 percent, and all-cause mortality 14 uh, percent. The, uh, it, very important to point out that, that there's not just a heart attack reduction. Why is that? You know, Gallup has polled Americans and said, what disease concerns you the most? Do you think it's heart disease? Do you think it's stroke? Less than 10 percent of people say heart disease or stroke. I think doctors like Muhammad have done such a good job treating it acutely that patients don't worry about it anymore. They say, God, heart attack? I, I saw Fred. He had a heart attack. A month ago, and I saw him back on the golf course. He got a stent and a statin. He's doing great. You know, they don't, they're not worried about it. What's number one? It's cancer, about 45 percent. Number two now, Alzheimer's, because we're the generation that's helping our parents, you know, and we're seeing our parents get the Alzheimer's. So that's about 35 percent of the population. The, uh, so what I tell patients is that interval activity is much better than continuous activity. And just to go through this, this is the actual slide we show them every day. 
and say, if you're doing continuous, that's great. You're getting up, you're doing something, you're exerting yourself. It can either be a heart rate or what I prefer is the relative perceived exertion that we do when we do a treadmill. You give them the RPE scale of 6 to 20 and say that's great, but intervals are better. And go intervals for short amounts of time, 30 to 120 seconds. And the 120 seconds, that reason, that is there because even if they've done a circulation at Oracle a few years ago on patients with EFs of 20 percent, they can go for 120 seconds and do it quite well. They don't get increased VTVF. So you keep it short so that, that recommendation is good for everybody. The second thing is tell them when you're in this part of the curve, this up, upswing, go really hard. Tell yourself, wow, this is really hard. I can't do this for very long. I'm going to give out. But don't give out. Slow down, get your breath back, and then do it again. But it's going to take you five minutes to get your breath back if you haven't been doing this regularly. Now, what are the benefits? Well, there's lots of benefits, and these are all different studies. But it raises your HDL more compared to continuous exercise. You lower your LDL particle counts more, which is different than the LDL uh, weight, but it still is beneficial. The very interesting thing is you use more calories. So doing the continuous for 30 minutes, calorie-wise, is like doing interval for 20 minutes. So what do you, what do, you do? You know, you, you, uh, I call my wife, usually my wife's a nurse, I call her about 5 o'clock and say, you want to go over to the gym. We have this very nice gym at, uh, at Mayo, and uh, we can all go use it. And um, I say, you want to go to the gym for an hour? And there'll be silence. <laughs> and she'll say, oh, you know, I've got some work to do, and I really need to. I'll say, how about 10 minutes? And she'll say, okay, 10 minutes. We can go ten, do 10 minutes. So we'll go over there. And at 10 minutes, I'll say, okay, let's go. And she goes, I, I can't leave yet. The Wheel of Fortune still hadn't had their final spin yet or something. You know. <laughs> so I'll tell patients, just do 10 minutes if that's all you have one day. I mean, you can be Barack Obama, and I'll guarantee you have 10 minutes a day. Just go do 10 minutes, do three intervals, and that's it. What happens within 30 seconds? Within 30 seconds of vigorously pushing yourself, you, your signals go out. Your, once your muscles start to feel the burn, which they do in 30 seconds, they send a signal to the heart. It says, heart, pump more. You know, your heart goes faster before you start breathing fast, if you ever noticed that. But it takes the blood to tell the, the lungs and tell the brain that the lungs need to breathe more. So the heart starts pumping more. They send a signal to the blood vessels. Say, vessels open up. The heart's going to be pumping more blood. If you don't get open, the blood can't get to me. So it lowers blood pressure. They send signals to the fat that we all develop as adults here and around our belly and say, listen, fat, we have enough sugar in our body for about 20 minutes. You know, why do runners pasta load the night before a big run? Because they want to get a bunch of carbs. We only have about 20 minutes of carbs in our body. So they'll say, listen, all this fat in here, all these triglycerides and fat, you start mobilizing the enzymes and mobilizing that fat to turn into an energy source I can use very quickly. And so good things happen in just seconds. Uh, so you get, you also get more blood vessel dilatation. It changes your messenger RNA response. So your endothelium puts out more vasodilators. And then finally, you get in better shape. You know, it's less boring, certainly. If you look at the Olympians, they all run the race like this, but they train for the race with the intervals because it puts you in better shape, and that's well known. So there's a lot of good things that happen and uh, get people to work on this. The, now, what about if you're older? You know, what if you're over 65? Does it matter? No, your muscles really don't care. They, they don't really care how old you are. Uh, this is uh, from the uh, women's uh, study looking at osteoporosis in the almost 10,000 women over age 65, and they said, let's see if, if exercise or activity helps reduce osteoporotic fractures and such. But they also followed them for cardiovascular outcomes. And you can see here that over six years, and the cumulative mortality is here, uh, this is the I mean, CV mortality, you can see that in the solid white is people that were women that were sedentary and stayed sedentary. The solid yellow were um, active and, and stayed active. And you can see the mortality from a heart disease at the end of six years was about 3% versus 10%. But what's interesting is look at the group that became sedentary, the white dashed line, their mortality went up. But look at the group that, that was, uh, became active. Their mortality went down just like they'd been active for years. Now, this wasn't a randomized trial. It was a prospectively followed trial, I should point out. And the total uh, mortality was the same. It, it uh, also showed a benefit. Uh, so it doesn't matter how old you are, it'll benefit you either way. And this was not a young group. At follow-up, the average age was almost 77 years old. So it really can help anybody. Now, I hate to uh, point this out, but this is a subway ticket machine in Moscow. And what I, 
what I hate to point out is that the Russians are ahead of us, and Putin ha had the right idea on this one. So you can go to the subway uh, ticket machine, and you do 30 squats, and you get a free ticket. <laughs> now, this is a wise use of technology. And I'd like to see something like this in this country. <clears throat> now, what about activity? Activity, physical activity like we talked about, vigorous leisure activity, exercise, whatever you want to call it. It does a lot of things. It increases your physical functioning. It improves your mental health. It improves your role that you see yourself, your physical body. It improves your emotional health. It improves your social functioning. You interact more with other people. It improves your vitality and general health, but it does increase one thing that's not good, and that's pain. <laughs> and how many times have you seen a patient, doctor, I can't exercise. Oh, my big toe, it hurts so much when I exercise. I say you have 205 joints in your body. If one of them hurts, use the other 204, okay? <clears throat> Put the big toe on the floor while you get on the elliptical or on the recumbent bike and use your arms and use your other leg. Now, the other thing I think to point out is this is a great quote from, from Einstein. He said, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it's stupid. The point of that is, ask them what they want to do. Don't say you have to get on this treadmill and you have to go this speed and you have to go this fast and you have to go this long. Say, what do you like to do? If you like to crochet real fast while you're walking, that's okay with me. If you like to swim, that's wonderful. You like to walk in the woods, whatever it is. But ask people what they want to do and start little. Say, just do a few minutes and let that grow. And when you do it for a few minutes, reward yourself that night. If you like wine from Northern California, have a glass of wine. If you like uh, you know, uh, ice cream, go to Dairy Queen, don't get a blizzard, because <laughs> that will negate everything that they, uh, they did for you. But get one of the sorbets or something like that. You know, get a small mini cone or a child's cone or something like that. Reward yourself, but just keep doing it. Now, I can't come to California and not talk about the benefits of wine, okay? <laughs> now, is it wine <clears throat> or is it alcohol? You know, it's very interesting that there's been debate. Uh, you've probably seen some of these debates in some of the literature, but there's the Pinot Noir guys and the Cabernet guys saying, oh, no, we're more antioxidants. Oh, no, no, we're better for the heart. They're fighting back and forth, and it's kind of silly because your body does not know where the alcohol comes from. It could be Pinot Noir. It could be Pinot Grigio. It could be whiskey. It could be Everclear. Your body doesn't <laughs> know where it came from. So this was a, a, a very interesting study in BMJ where they have databases where I didn't know these databases really occurred, but they, they know that if you go into stores, can, you can buy alcohol in grocery stores here? Yeah. In Minnesota, we can't. But if they went to states that have stores, they'll sell alcohol in the same store they sell groceries. And they said, what if you went in there and bought only wine or only beer? What else do you buy with the only wine or only beer? And it was very, very telling. So here it was, and here was the, uh, here's the line of identity, one in the middle, equal. Here was wine on the left and beer on the right. So you can see the wine buyers, what do they buy? Olives, low-fat cheese, fruits, vegetables, oils, low-fat milk. What do the beer buyers buy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it may be the alcohol, <laughs> but it may be what we consume with the alcohol. But one drink a day does reduce MI. Uh, it, uh, alcohol at any level is arrhythmogenic. If you have patients with arrhythmias, say alcohol at any level, uh, two ounces of wine will increase arrhythmias. But it does seem to reduce um, cardiovascular disease. So I told you you'd see this, this slide again. Um, and this was the retrospective data. But in ARIC was the prospective data of 16,000 patients. They brought them in and said, listen, we want you to start, we want you to stop smoking, we want you to be active, we want you to eat fruits and vegetables, we want you to try to lose weight. And if they did those four things, that lowered their cardiovascular event rate 40% in four years. Now, that's better than any stent study, that's better than bypass, that's better than any statin, including a torvastatin, which at $10 billion a year was the biggest selling drug in the history of the world at its peak. Why, why does this work? Well, was it the weight loss? I doubt it. Only about 2% of people in the, the 16,000 lost weight down to a BMI of 25. But the key was getting a BMI less than 30. You know, there's a big cut point at 30. So I tell patients, if you can't get to 25, that's okay, but get it less than 30. But the fruits and vegetables, the activity, the smoking is very important. So we all have scores for disease. You're familiar with the Framingham score. This is a different one. Uh, this is a score for developing disease at 20 years. 
looking at age, and so the older you are, you get more points. Men get points. The increased body mass index get, gets more points over 30. If you're inactive, you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, and lower education, you get more points. So you add the points up, and the more you have, the more likely you are to get disease at 20 years. So what disease is this? Well, again, I'm a cardiologist. It's obviously heart disease, right? It's actually dementia. So the point is that the same risk factors, you know, that we talk about for heart disease, it's the same relationship with dementia, same relationship with uh, erectile dysfunction. You want to get a man's uh, attention, mm -hmm. talk to him about ED, and he'll start to listen. Uh, breast cancers, you know, lots of breast cancers and, and almost all colon cancers have a direct relationship to these same factors. So I've looked at risk formulas uh, for de predicting disease in of certain diseases, five diseases. MI stroke, we know about that one. Erectile dysfunction, the urologists have a risk score for developing it. Diabetes, dementia, and lung cancer. And look at the, let's look at the risk factors that predict these five different diseases. So here are the risk factors. It's a busy slide, but I'll, I'll walk you through this. So here are the diseases up here, the five diseases. On the left are the factors, and these are the genetic factors, like you can't change your age, your gender, your ethnicity, or if your brother has diabetes. Uh, here are the lifestyle risk factors, you know, your cholesterol, your, your, your weight, your smoking, your activity, your education. And in any disease where gender is a risk factor, men get the short end of the stick. Every disease where gender is a risk factor, men have more of it. If you look at the classic risk factors here, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, tobacco, look at this. The overlap is tremendous. And so that in these, uh, especially these four diseases on the left, 75% of the risk factors are the same. So the point is when you talk to patients about living longer, feeling better, don't talk to them about heart disease and stroke. They don't really care about it. Talk to them about dementia. Talk to them about, um, you know, about cancers. If you're talking to a man, talk to him about erectile dysfunction. They'll get his, they'll get his attention. Now this, I was in Slovenia a few weeks ago, and this uh, vending machine says, let's pizza. So you put your money in here, and two and a half minutes later, the pizza comes out here. And this says in Slovenia, I asked the guys what it says. They said, it says, made fresh daily. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a poor use of technology, <laughs> but I'm sure we'll see them near us soon. So I've talked about reducing heart disease. What about atrial fibrillation? You know, atrial fibrillation, the disease of longevity. When you're 20 years old in this country, one in 20,000 people have AFib. When you're 80 years old in this country, one in eight people have AFib. So it is a disease of longevity. And so um, they've actually looked in, in the ARC study again and said, in, again, in 15,000 patients, what are the risk factors for AFib? And they said, well, it's if you have heart failure or coronary disease, if you have high blood pressure, if your body weight uh, is high, you have diabetes or high blood sugar, or you smoke. And optimal is to have none of these things or have normal blood pressure. Borderline, and then any of them was, was elevated, was on the right. And so they looked at this and said that AF can be significantly reduced by lifestyle. How do I mean? Well, if you are elevated, your risk was about seven, six and a half, seven-fold higher than if you're optimal. Or, or I should put it a different way, if you use the, uh, the elevated group as one, you can reduce it by 70% by having a more ideal lifestyle. So you reduce life, you, and I don't know if you've seen this recent AFib uh, study that came out, I don't have a slide of it, but it was with activity showing people as they were active, uh, it reduced their incidence of AFib. Uh, how about heart failure? And this was a study looking at heart failure, your lifetime risk, if you had a prior MI, prior diabetes, or prior hypertension. So say you get a patient that already has those things. They come into you, they've already had a heart attack. They already have high blood pressure. They already have, have diabetes. That according to the number of healthy lifestyle factors, and again, they kind of look the same over and over again, don't they? Body mass index, smoking, exercise, Breakfast cereal consumption, I think that, that was a surrogate basically for eating breakfast is what, what it meant. And then fruits and vegetables. And if you did all of these healthy lifestyles here on the right versus uh, here on the left, you can see you can reduce your risk. I'm sorry this is covered up. This is a 20% incidence or about 18% here. And here it's about a 7 or 8% incidence. So you could lower it by about half. Uh, even after you had all these diseases, you could lower your risk of heart failure. 
so 60 percent reduction. The, um, <clears throat> what about sudden death? You know, half of the deaths in this country now are sudden deaths. Can we reduce sudden death? I mean, that's a, that's a bolt of lightning. You know, how do you predict that? Well, the, um, I kind of call these studies the snowblower study in that they've done different snowblower studies where they say, and like in Chicago, we know there's going to be a big snow this weekend. Let's ask every patient that comes in with chest pain one question when they were blowing snow and got their heart attack. One question is, how vigorous are you usually on average? Meaning, do you, are you vigorous less than once a week on the right, one to four times a week, or over five times a week? And then their risk of having sudden cardiac death with vigorous exertion, they could calculate it. If you were very active on a regular basis, then your risk was about 11 uh, out of uh, you know, the huge denominator, which I think was 100,000. Um, if you were somewhat vigorous, 19, but if this was, if you're the weekend warrior, you never do anything, and then you go out and you blow snow or do something active, then your risk of, of sudden death went up 70-fold. Now, you and I both know that 70-fold versus 11-fold out of hundreds of thousands is a tiny amount. But, you know, if you're the one, because <laughs> remember, we're all going to be the next person to die on this earth someday. If you're the one, it can make a difference. Um, our approach in this country is more medications. We're very medicine heavy, as you know. Do our patients take our medicines? I don't know if you've heard of the MI free study, but it was 6,000 patients that had an MI. They looked at them for three years, and they gave them full coverage. They gave them free ACEs and ARBs, beta blockers and statins, or you had to pay for it, you know, maybe 40 bucks a month. It's still generic. So the good news is that if you got full coverage, you're about a 40 percent more likely to still be taking all three medicines at the end of three years. The bad news is, even if you got full coverage, only one out of 12 or one out of eight patients or 12 percent were taking all three of the medicines. Three years. I mean, I've asked groups, I'm not going to ask this group, but say, how many of you think that your patients take your medicines, you know, 80 percent of the time at three years? And the whole group raises their hands after a heart attack. They say, oh, yeah, our patients take our medicines. They tell me they do. And they don't. And adherence in this study <laughs> was actually 80 percent of the medicines. So I work at a big clinic. If I showed up for work eight days out of 10, do you think they'd call me adherent? <laughs> they may call me something else like out of work. <laughs> you know, so 80%, that, that's a low bar. So patients really aren't taking our medicines. Um, so the future, let's talk about the future just for a moment. What about kids? Well, if you look at cardiorespiratory fitness in young adults, and their development of risk factors later in life. <clears throat> it's very interesting. 5,000 uh, adults, young adults, age 25. If a man could, uh, should be able to go at least about 10 minutes, the woman about 8 minutes, which really is not much for a 25-year-old. That's, that's actually below the average of what they should do. If they could not go this level, you can see that in 15 years, now that's by age 40, 38 percent of them had hypertension, 47 percent were diabetic, a third had metabolic syndrome, and 20 percent had high cholesterol. So what we do early in life is very helpful later in life. So it's important to you know, have our patients uh, start things even in their 20s. Now, when does a child's vigorous physical activity start to embed in their brain? When does it start to affect them? And this is a very interesting study. They looked at kids age 2 to 9. And on the top here, you can see uh, this was the uh, boys and the girls on the right. This is the younger age, 2 to 6, the older age, 6 to 9 here. And what this points out is this is their CB risk score later in life, Com looking at them when they were age 2 to 6 or 6 to 9. And so you can see on the top here, uh, there wasn't as good of a correlation as they would have liked with the risk score. The more active kids were on the right. But if they were active, uh, physically active, age 6 to 9, you can see there's a direct correlation. The more act active they were, a much better correlation with having less cardiovascular risk factors later in life. So what it pointed out was that the kids uh, kind of rheostat or uh, for that predicts how active they're going to be in life is pretty well set age six to nine. We know that salt intake in humans is pretty much set, guess when, in utero. How much salt your mother ate it depends on how much salt you may want to eat as, a, as an adult. We can't change that much. <laughs> But, but it does tell us that in the six to nine age range, kids need to start to be more active. So this is a big problem that we need to, you know, a, a society needs to approach. Uh, but the six to nine age group is very important. 
Uh, and then finally, a couple of things, an optimal diet. This is defined by the CDC. Optimal diet is, the, again, the fruits and vegetables, having fish, you know, it sounds like the Mediterranean diet, fiber-rich whole grains, three a day, less than 1,500 milligrams of sodium a day, and sugar drinks, less than 450 calories, or 36 ounces a week. And they said, you know, how are we doing in the U.S.? And they looked at a couple of groups, and they said, let's look at adults over age 20 and children aged 12 to 19. And what percent of the population is doing all five? <coughs> now, just think to yourself, are you doing all five of these? Well, if you are, if you tell me you are, you're probably lying to me. <laughs> One out of 300 people. But, you know, thank God for our next generation. What percent of kids do you think are doing this? And this is not a typographical error. It is 0.0 percent. And it's basically the sugar drinks. But, it, you, know, you know, kids don't eat fish and all those things. But, you know, they, you, we've all seen kids. Those of you that have kids that have grown up, what they do as adults, they did just like when they were kids. When they, the kids fight at age 25 or 30, it was just like the fight they had when they were 8 or 10 years old. It's the same, same issues, you know. And the kids do what they learn. And if we don't teach them right, they're not going to do it right later in life. So secondary prevention is intervene after the disease occurs. Primary prevention is inter intervene before the disease occurs. And primordial is to intervene before the risk factor occurs. Now, you know, we're going away from, we say it's all individual medicine, but I think we're going away from it. And we're going more towards healthcare system medicine, as you know. And a poor healthcare system intervenes after the disease occurs, an average one before the disease occurs, and a superior healthcare system is going to intervene before the risk factor occurs. And that's where we're going to go. You know, Maya, we've been told the next couple of years we're going to be responsible for a few hundred thousand patients. We're getting X number of dollars, and that covers everything. Okay, we know who's in the population, we know how many bypasses they should have, how many stents. We know how many gallbladders they should have taken out, et cetera. And here's the money, here's the pot. If you can prevent those things from occurring, then you get to keep more of the money. And that's where, that's where it's going to go. So we're going to have to intervene before the risk factor occurs. One last slide. This is a patient I had, 49-year-old man. And I, I gave him my best advice <clears throat> and said, I want you to, uh, to start uh, doing this, my advice. He came back 10 weeks later, and he had lowered his cholesterol by 23%. He lowered his triglycerides 60 percent, raised his HDL about a quarter, and lowered his LDL 21 percent in 10 weeks. What do you think I told him? Take this statin, take this diet pill, exercise and lose weight. Well, this was actually me. Uh, th this was uh, those of you that read Wall Street Journal, Ron Winslow, who writes a great column in the Wall Street Journal on health, wrote this up a few years ago and said it's little things and you can do it. And, uh, and I, when, I, when I did this, I was just transitioning from my interventional cardiology career in the cath lab in the CCU to now my prevention career. And I've become a preventionist. And, um, and if I can do it, believe me, anybody can do it. So thank you for your attention. I'll, and this is the email if you want to ask me any questions. Thank you. It's, uh, it's always difficult when you have an audience like this where you have some specialists and some internists and you have nurses and nurse practitioners and you, your, your talk, want, you want to make sure that everybody comes away with something from it and I can guarantee you we all came away with something from it. Terrific discussion. Questions? We have, fifth, we have ample time, so this is your opportunity. Yes, sir. Dr. Few, a couple of comments. Uh, that was a great talk. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. We never get to talk about lifestyle. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, you know, you say, listen, you're going to live 10 years longer. And they say, so what? <laughs> they don't right. care. Right. They say, you're going to feel better and sleep better tonight. And they say, I'll do it. I like it. And that's why I say, you know, if you exercise, if you're active, whatever it is you call it, then reward yourself and notice how good you feel that night, how well you sleep. And, and, and it really is true. Absolutely. And the 
second comment I wanted to make, there's a lot of controversy about diets now, and I, yeah. I'm, I'm giving a little bit of thought on that because I yeah. don't have much time to talk about diets, but there's all yeah. kinds of diets out there, low carb, high yeah. carb, yeah. high fat, low fat. I just wanted you to comment, there's a project, uh, David Katz has a project, the president of American College of Lifestyle Medicine, called the Glimmer Project, mm -hmm. and he's basically bringing everybody together and saying, we know what we should eat, we can argue about it in detail, mm -hmm. but there's a lot we can agree on, you know, people are constantly debating this or that. Yeah. What we really need to do is move towards a consensus. Mm -hmm. and there is a consensus mm -hmm. out there, but we spend so much time arguing about different diets, we get lost parts, we get lost in the trees, lost in the forest. So yeah. Can I comment about yeah, that? Yeah. About well, diets are interesting. I mean, two things. One is, for every patient that asks me how many calories a day should I eat, doctor, I would say I will tell you exactly if you can tell me exactly how many calories you're eating. <laughs> and no one has ever told me how many calories. We don't know. We have no idea how many calories we're eating. You know, the second thing is, a lot of diets work. They work beautifully if you stay on them. <laughs> and what's the one you can stay on? Is it Esselstein's low-fat diet? Is it Ornish's diet? Is it uh, some of these, you know, extreme low-carb diets? No. What's the one you can stay on? Well, they've stayed on it around the Mediterranean for a couple of thousand years, and it's nice. We go to restaurants and pay money for a Mediterranean. We had a great Mediterranean meal last night and said, uh, and we, we like it. It's sustainable, it's proven, and it's beneficial. So to me, the Mediterranean, the fruits and the vegetables, you know, the whole grains, the fish, the less meat, that's, that's the easy part uh, to do. It's just getting people out of their rut of thinking they have to have meat and potatoes in Minnesota or or whatever you eat here in, uh, in, Southern Cal in Northern California.